<laughs> I'm trying to position mine so you can see it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the virtual book launch of The Vanishing Heart, a new novel by Brett Hart. My name is Jennifer Malik. I'm the editor of The Reading List. And we're hosting this event in combination with Kiki Natrix, who you see on screen with me, and uh, Jonathan Ball Publishers. If you have any questions for, um, for Brett or about the book this evening, uh, please leave them in the comment section on whatever platform you're watching us on, YouTube or Facebook. I'll be passing those questions on during the audience Q&A, which we're going to have at the end of the conversation. Uh, let me just do some introductions. Um, joining me this evening from the Tiki Natives is Alma Manisha Tsele, uh, a medical doctor who is currently working in the pharmaceutical sector. She has a special interest in pharmaceutical economics and its relationship to the socio-economics of health, particularly in public health. Dr. Tsele was a Mandela Washington Fellow in 2019 and was named as one of the Bailing Guardian 200 young South Africans in the same year. And I'm very bitter because last year was the last year that I could have made that list, so it didn't happen for me. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, also from the Cheeky Nectars is Lusho Honolo Mokorane, um, a queer lawyer and activist. His areas of interest include queer theory, intersectionality, and dismantling oppressive systems. He obtained the Sonke UCLA Health and Human Rights Fellowship in 2017-2018 and completed his Master's in Law, specializing in public interest law and policy and critical race studies. He was also named one of the top 200 young South Africans in 2018. Um, Lechogonolo and Alma Malicha are the founding members of the Chief Natives, who I'm sure you've all heard of. It's a literary podcast aiming to archive black literature on the continent and in the diaspora by providing curated author launches, live podcasts, and reviews. And the Kiki Natives also recently started an online bookstore called the Kiki Merchant. Um, so if you're craving a new read during lockdown, I highly recommend checking that out at kikinatives.co.za. It's a curated list, I think, guys. It seems to be a curated yes, list of, of, of like um, new fiction and nonfiction and some older stuff as well. So it's just a really great selection of books. And apparently there is they, they are delivered quick fast from what I see on Twitter. So that's also cool. <laughs> and then our featured author this evening, Britt Bennett. Um, and we are truly delighted to have you with us. Thank you so, so much for joining us all the way from the United States. Britt Bennett was born and raised in Southern California. She graduated from Stanford University and later earned her MFA in fiction at the University of Michigan, where she won a Hopwood a Hopwood Award in graduate short fiction. In 2014, she received the Hurston Wright Award for College Writers. She's a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree, and her debut novel, The Mothers, was a New York Times bestseller. Her second novel, which is the one we're going to talk about this evening, The Vanishing Half, was also an instant number one New York Times bestseller. Her nonfiction essays have appeared in the New York, with the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, the Parish Review, and Visible. Um, and the book we're talking about tonight, The Vanishing Half, it's an engrossing and provocative novel about twin sisters who are inseparable as children. They ultimately choose to live in two very different worlds, one black and one white. Remember to leave your questions in the comment section and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Lisho Honolo and Alma and Britt to continue the conversation. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so, I mean, I think today Alma and I are essentially here to give Brit her flowers um, because I think <laughs> the vanishing half deserves all the flowers that it's going to get, right? And all the awards that it's going to receive. Um, Alma and I both had a really fantastic time reading the book and also having discussions about the book. And we wanted to bring Britt over to just, you know, give her her flowers, but more importantly, to talk some of the very important themes that come up in the book and to just, you know, get an insight on the writing side and like, obviously, who are some of the characters that she didn't enjoy and uh, who, who frustrated <laughs> her. Um, I, I thought it was really important for us to start the conversation to think of the vanishing half as as scholarship, because I think oftentimes we don't think of, you know, novels and fiction as scholarship. But I think really what The Vanishing Half does is allows us to 
to think more deeply about race. So I wanted to, us to start the conversation by thinking and returning to Cheryl Harris' Whiteness as Property, which was published almost 23 years ago. And I wanted to just read the first part of Whiteness as Property in order to bring the vanishing half in conversation with the wonderful Cheryl Harris, who's a critical scholar. And Cheryl, Cheryl writes in her introduction, in the, in the 30s, some years after my mother's family became part of the great river of black migration that flowed north, my Mississippi-born grandmother was confronted with harsh economic, the harsh matter of economic survival for herself and her two daughters. Having separated from my grandfather, who himself was trapped on the fringes of economic marginality, she took one look, hard look at her choices and represented herself for employment at a major retail store in Chicago Central Business. This decision would have been unremarkable for a white woman in similar circumstances, but for my grandmother, it was an act of both great daring and self-denial, for in doing so, she was presenting herself as a white woman in a palace of racist America she was passing. No longer immediately identifiable as Lula's daughter, she could thus enter the white world, albeit on a false passport, not merely passing, but trespassing. And I think in many ways, one of the major themes is that in, in, in The Vanishing Half is, is the theme of passing, but also trespassing. And I wanted us to begin the conversation by thinking about the, the, the title of the book and to ask you, Britt, like the title is brilliant because there's a lot of vanishing halves that happen in the book, but why was this the fitting title for this novel? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you everyone for watching. Um, the title I really cannot take credit for. It was sort of a community effort of coming up with it. Um, I had a lot of really bad titles that I was thinking about as I was working on the book. Um, and eventually my agent was the one who came up with The Vanishing Half and we ended up all really enjoying it. Um, I think the reasons that we liked it were, were some of the reasons that you touched on. Um, I think it speaks to a lot of the thematics in the book. Um, it speaks to most literally perhaps Stella being sort of the vanishing half of Desiree. Um, it speaks to kind of the disappearance of blackness in Stella's life and, and the half of her life that she can never really talk about or address to anybody because that's the part of her life where she lived as a black woman. Um, and there are all these other characters in the book, as you said, who go through these moments of transformation and change um, and become somebody else, but also lose who they were. Uh, so I thought that the, the title spoke to the thematics in the book on a lot of different levels. I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, as we're talking about it, you know, that passing is, is, a, is a mystery tradition that's been explored quite a lot in, in literature, but we often find of observation for there to be a catch moment, right? For the person who's passing to be caught or there's some sort of implicit moment that happens. But in the vanishing half, we explore, we explore uh, sort of passing as almost just another expression of identity, as right? an interstated way in which you view the way in which Stella makes the case that she does pass. And I, I'm very curious about in this long standing tradition of how passing has been thought of in, in literature, you then show the case of exploration as, as a this interstated exploration of identity and this is how you look at Stella's past. And I'm curious about what motivated that um, yeah, I mean, I think like you're saying, there's there's a really long uh, literary tradition of passing literature, particularly um, in, in Black American literature. And something that I was aware of that I was kind of writing into and writing toward, um, I think that, uh, you know, historically, uh, I think passing figures are very complicated because they're, they're very contradictory. Um, there's a sense that, you know, by Stella deciding to be white, that she is doing something that's transgressive, perhaps, um, because if she can walk into a building and become a white person just because she decides to uh, accept somebody reading her that way, then what does it really mean to be white in this world if it's if it's something that is so sort of flimsy um, and something that's that can be obtained um, through performance? Uh, but on the flip side, you know, Stella attains power and security and safety and wealth. And she only attains those through being white. She doesn't attain them as a black woman. So that kind of bolsters the power of whiteness in a way. Yeah. Um, and I think there's something about that contradiction in passing literature that's really interesting. And for me, I wanted to, to kind of lean into that contradiction 
but I also just wanted to write about passing from my perspective as a 21st century writer, which is going to be different than most of our really iconic stories of passing, which took place 100 years ago. Um, and I wanted to, to kind of start at the standpoint of what does passing look like if we think that these categories are already fluid, or if they think of these categories as being inherently unstable or unclear. Um, what does it really mean to pass then if, if we don't see that there are sort of definite and clear borders between these categories? And that to me was, was a way that I, I wanted to honor the tradition that I was writing into, but also take it in a different direction as, as a contemporary writer. Yeah. And I thought you did that so brilliantly because I immediately, as I was reading this, thought about whiteness as property by Cheryl Harris. And that's why I wanted to bring these two into the conversation because I think that's the work that you're doing, right? Thinking about the idea of passing, but also Stella in many ways is trespassing, right? And it feels like in, in there's like a lot of access to humanity that Stella gets because she's white. And uh, what does that say about like the, the commodity of whiteness, right? at the expense of blackness. And I wanted to, to really spend a little bit talking about that, right? Thinking about the commentary of like whiteness as a construct and thinking about blackness as like subordinate to whiteness and why it was important for you to explore it in that way. Because we can definitely see Desiree and Stella as two polar opposites of what happens because of how they chose to inhabit their identities. Yeah, I mean, I think I was I was interested in writing about race in general as a construct, but also as a construct that has very tangible realities and very tangible implications. Uh, I think sometimes when you say that something is a construct, people think that you're saying that it's not real. Um, and it's like, it's not imaginary. Um, we all experience the implications of race that trickle down to where we live and where uh, our kids go to school and who we marry and what our kids look like and <laughs> how we feel about our bodies and who we see on television and what we read and the language that we have access to. I mean, those, those sort of tentacles of race spread everywhere. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like I said, there is something flimsy to it. The fact that Stella can walk into a room and somebody thinks that she's white, so then she gets this job. And then she sort of, her life kind of snowballs from there, these series of cascading choices um, and the idea that she doesn't change anything about herself, even physically, she walks into a room as a black woman and leaves as a white woman. And what does that really mean about what it means to be white or black or anything? Um, so those were questions that I was really thinking about as I was working on the book of sort of sitting in that duality of race, of it being something that is in a lot of ways quite imaginary, but also in a lot of ways the, the realest thing that we all do with in our lives. Um, and, and particularly in my context as a, as a black American writer. Um, so I wanted to kind of think about sitting in that, in that duality and thinking also as far as whiteness goes, thinking just about Stella's sort of education in whiteness, which is something that she has to learn. She has to learn how to be white. Um, mm -hmm. And she's always kind of doing it wrong. She's never quite doing mm -hmm. it in the way that she should be doing it because the only thing that she knows about white people is interacting with white people as a black person. <laughs> Um, and she knows the sort of, you know, the kind of good old boys in, in rural Louisiana that she has been experiencing. And that's very different than her husband who comes from this like East coast kind of wealth. Um, and you know, he's the type of man, he'd never burn a cross in someone's lawn, you know, but he's the type of person who would, you know, sign a petition so that a black family can't move to his neighborhood. Uh, but that's a different way that whiteness is leveraged, and that's not something that Stella has ever experienced. Like, how would she have any way of knowing that? Um, so I, I had fun exploring the ways in which she is constantly undergoing this education of whiteness and trying to understand how to perform whiteness correctly and convincingly, and is always kind of doing it uh, inappropriately. I think something that becomes very that becomes very visible in this performance of whiteness is her relationship with Loretta. Um, and early on when I was speaking to the clock and I was actually telling my, I was thinking about this quote that uh, Toni Morrison has, and she says that there's no lonelier woman in the world than a woman who doesn't have a close female friend. And you see the relationship with, uh, with Loretta as an example of that. So we see that Stella's operating in this, in this white community and this performance of whiteness. And she's been very introverted because like you're saying, she's very nervous about not quite being able to perform whiteness in the way that she should. And then you see her interacting with Loretta and it seems like 
there's an element of envy because Larissa is able to inhabit the space in the fullness of who she is. Larissa comes into the neighborhood, she's fully a black woman and she's in this white neighborhood and she makes all of these white people uncomfortable. And you can see Stella is also very excited to have somebody who looks who is similar in many ways to her, but in ways that she can just never overtly express. And I wanted us to explore that anxiety that, that Stella that Stella feels, because I feel that Stella just traded one anxiety, which is the precarity of Black life and, and all the manifestations that it is, for another, and, and that is the anxiety of being able to perform whiteness, and how many Black people have to straddle those kinds of roles. <laughs> no, we yeah. can't come fishing now, but I, I often feel like, <laughs> It's the trading of one anxiety for the other as a black person. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. Um, you know, I think I, I was on a call with somebody else who described Stella as a fugitive. And that's something that always really stuck with me because I think that's certainly the way that she moves through the world. Um, as somebody who's sort of gotten away with the crime and is so always, <laughs> can never live in peace because you're constantly worried that you're going to get caught. Um, there's that type of anxiety that follows her. Um, I think with Loretta, I kept thinking about, originally just thinking about what happens if there's a black family that tries to move into Stella's neighborhood and you first meet Stella again when she's trying to prevent that family from moving in. And that this would be something that would be so uh, nerve wracking for her is the possibility of this black family living across the cul-de-sac from her. Like, literally, I could look at my blinds and see them and they could see me. Um, mm -hmm. But then I started to think about how interesting it could be if that family does move in and we see Stella having to navigate that reality with this woman who in a lot of ways reminds her of her sister and 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 is as you said uh, a woman who not only is sort of unapologetically herself but also has community she has these friends these girlfriends who come over and hang out and mm -hmm. and Stella seeing that seeing this woman who ended up in the same neighborhood that Stella ended up in for for similar reasons which is that she married a man who's got some money <laughs> um but is is herself and has community and is not and it and yeah is still isolated in this white neighborhood and quite miserable there so it's not that loretta's life is perfect but she has these things that stella really wants um mm -hmm. as far as the relationships she has in the community and even the ways in which her marriage seems sort of aspirational because her husband she doesn't have to lie to her husband the whole time like stella does um so mm -hmm. yeah i loved writing that relationship and thinking about how Stella would navigate it and the idea that the worst thing that Stella could do in her mind is get close to a black person uh, because she doesn't want to tip off anybody and she also doesn't want a black person to sort of call her out and expose her um, and yet that is the thing that she's drawn most to doing because of her loneliness. Do you think yeah. Loretta knew, I mean I'm curious, do you think Loretta knew yeah. that Stella was passing? Um, yeah. What, what was a possible reimagination for how that could have ended that relationship? Yeah, there were a lot of different versions where Loretta calls her out um, that I wrote, but ultimately I didn't want to really tip my hand in that way. Um, in part because I think Stella's relationship with Loretta is really a moment in which she leverages the power within her whiteness for kind of the first time. Um, yeah. So it's really important that, that to me that, that, that you see that sort of relationship develop in the way that it does and unravel in the way that it does. Um, and I, I, I was coy, I think, with Loretta knowing. Um, I have some readers uh, are like, she definitely knew, and some readers don't think she did. Um, so I shot the line a little bit. There were moments where Loretta says things that make you think, OK, I think she does know. Um, yeah, so yeah. in my mind, I think that she knows. Uh, but <laughs> I um, but I also like I don't I ultimately don't think it matters that much because she doesn't she doesn't call sell out and like why i mean i guess there are reasons maybe why you would but i think there's a part of loretta that's kind of amused <laughs> like if there's an amusement and, and at heart of it um mm. but but yeah but I, I liked playing with that that sort of possibility does she know does she not know and and i think also because you're so deeply in stella's mind it doesn't really matter if loretta knows it's that stella is worried that she knows <laughs> that matters actually more yeah uh, you spoke a bit about the, the, the deception, and I think that uh, there's this tem temporality of choice that happens in the book, right? So people choose particular things, but effectively the choices that make lead to some form of deception. And there's a lot of lying. Like, these people just lie, you know? Mm. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to, to, us to think a little bit about that. Like, what was the place of like, deception throughout the book? You think about Desiree, for instance, returning back to Mallet, 
and you know lying to certain parts about why she's returned but we know why she's back there and i wanted to know why deception was such a large theme in the book yeah i mean i just i like <laughs> i like lies i like writing about people who lie um i think lies are interesting i think that they reveal um, a lot about ourselves and what we lie about. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we lie about stupid things that don't really matter that much. Um, they're not always these huge things like Stella's lying about. Sometimes there are these small things where you lie to save face or, um, you know, if someone's lying about something, it makes me wonder, like, what are they ashamed of? What are they afraid about? Uh, it speaks to some of those deeper emotions, I think. Um, and I think there's also a feeling of, I heard somebody say once that, uh, you know, secrets are, secrets are a form of trust um, or their form of respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that there, there can be this feeling of keeping something from somebody that's a bad thing. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think there are ways in which characters in this book are keeping secrets um, or are joined in secrets. And it's not uh, necessarily deceptive. It's just something that's private. It's something that's, uh, that bonds these two people because they are sh keeping a shared secret. Um, and I think that's ultimately something that happens with, um, I don't know, are, are we, can I spoil? Like, are, is this like a spoiler free? We can, we, we're like, look, people will read it just because of how great this conversation is. Okay. So we can spoil. People will okay. read it because, okay. yeah, it's, it's amazing. And they love the mothers and we're all just like big Brits. So <laughs> okay, I will try, I'm trying not to, to give everything away, but. Uh, but yeah, but there's several secrets that, that are kept um, in the book between characters and the moment of keeping the secret is something that bonds them. And all, all I'll say, there's a moment late in the book with Stella and she decides to enter into a secret with another character. Um, and, um, and I think that that's a moment where you see the intimacy of that secret. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah. I think that there are these moments of, you know, lies and secrets, they're not necessarily uh, exactly the same thing, but I think that there can be overlap. Um, and there's ways in which I, I find them just interesting as, as revealing character or strengthening or destroying relationships in some ways. Um, and also there are ways in which they bring people close together. Speaking of that intimate scene, we don't want to give away too much, but there is an intimate scene between Stella and Early, right? And I think what's powerful about that scene between Stella and Early is that it, it is a contrast, and I think that you've done this contrast so beautifully, between one person who does the abandoning and another who has been abandoned. And I think that this book is in many ways a mirror image so you see often two characters who are on the other side of of, a, of an action so in that in that instance you see that intimate that intimate moments between Stella and early which is just two sides of the coin of abandonment right so even early in that moment is able to understand why he's experienced that abandonment and what that must have meant for the people who abandoned him without giving too much away and I, I find it very interesting that you've, you've written about how love can even exist in spaces like that, right? So we often think of love as this, this like beautiful energy, this thing that exists outside of whatever. But you have in that particular moment, and I think that in, in weaving the themes of loss and abandonment, you've also been able to show the existence of love in that space. And I'm curious about what your thoughts are about the existence of love in those kind of spaces that even early is able to find or to see that there is love even in the abandonments that he's experienced. And even Stella's abandonment of her family is in some ways an act of love. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I just think as far as that scene goes, like I'm, I'm always interested in, uh, in characters trying to empathize with each other. Um, and whether they fail to or not, I think um, that I want to think about characters who are trying to see across difference. Um, and there are lots of different ways in which people are different in this book, but that's something between the two of them and their, their role in that way that you described. So I wanted to think about that moment. And I think there are also just pairs that I wanted to see together because when you first meet early, early on in the book, he, he is looking for Stella um, mm. and having a moment where you see him actually with her, um, it, although not in the way in which maybe you thought or the way in which maybe he thought. Um, I thought that that was something that, that would be fun to explore. So I don't know. I mean, I think I'm, I'm interested in this book. I think in a lot of ways about the complexity of love, I think, um, 
I knew I was writing about Stella and Desiree, who, are, who would be the central relationship in the book, although they barely spare, spend any time physically together in the book. Um, so that was going to be writing about this complicated sister relationship that is it's lasting throughout space and time, although these two people are not physically together. Um, and there were other relationships, I think like Desiree and Early, who have this, this relationship that um, is, uh, you know, this romance that carries on, although he leaves and, sh and, and always is leaving, but always comes back. Um, mm. And they're not legally married and they don't really live together the full time. Um, so there's something a little unorthodox maybe about their relationship, but I wanted to write about that and thinking about what does love look like when it's not about possessing and not about being possessed by somebody? What does it look like mm -hmm. to love somebody in a way where you let them go and they let you go and you go your separate ways and you come back again. And there's not this feeling of being sort of <laughs> locking somebody in and try, you know, being someone's ball and chain, um, as they say, which is horrifying. I think a horrifying way to think about a marriage um, so I wanted to think about what that, what that relationship looks like in this sort of unconventional, it's not, not a traditional marriage in any sense, but these are two people who've chosen to grow old together and in a way that is not oppressive and, and not about possessing somebody. Um, so I wanted to think about all those different ways in which love and family can be constructed that are maybe differently than what we expect and maybe differently than what the characters expect. And I think also to think about you writing about love one of the other couple that i really really loved in the book was thinking about jude and reese right yeah. so for me it was like the softer more tender moments in the book right i wanted to applaud you for that because i think that you really wrote that relationship so beautifully because in many ways what the relationship between reese and jude was trying to explore is also a commentary on like closer to whiteness and closer to lightness, you're more desirable. And how many times people sort of are jarred and like, wow, like you are, you, you two are really together. Like you're conventionally like quintessentially beautiful and you're not because of how we've constructed beauty standards and how did you two end up together? So I thought that exploration was really wonderful. And I wanted us to speak more about why it was important for you to do that exploration. But also I think connected to that is thinking about like writing Reese as the man that he is and the man that he's becoming and how in many ways I really appreciated that because we met Reese in the moment where he was ready to share himself with us, but with nobody else in the book. And it wasn't like this hoo-ha type of thing. So also thinking about the idea of what is the utility of a coming out to particular people and why that's important. Yeah, um, well, to, so to the second part of your question, um, I think, yeah, that was, I, I knew that, um, that there can be uh, sort of a fascination with, with coming out narratives, um, because it, I think there's a trajectory that people are familiar with. Um, mm. And uh, there's, you know, there's a sort of internal conflict. And, you know, there are beats of a story that, that are, that can be, useful to writers I think, when, you, when you think about it um but but for me I, you know i think that there's there's sometimes we focus too much on those moments of somebody's life um and and for reese i wanted to meet him in that moment that you're saying where um you know his close friends know his journey but nobody else knows or really needs to know and, and jude doesn't tell anybody um that was mm -hmm. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was talking about, you know, secrets being a sign of respect, it's not because she's ashamed of him. It's because this is his life. Um, yeah. So there is uh, this moment in which we meet him um, and we and we get glimpses of what some of his, his past was like and his sort of um, his journey into California. Uh, but it was really important for me to, to meet him in that place um, where when we learn his journey, it's him choosing to tell Jude. Um, and that I didn't want to treat this as some type of cheap reveal or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's just something he tells her quite matter-of-factly, and then you move on. Um, so <laughs> I didn't want to treat um, Reese's identity as some type of a problem for the story to solve. Um, I That was like one of my things as I was writing the book was just like bodies are not problems, identities are not problems. Um, so I, I that was something that was in my forefront of mind, so I knew that I, I didn't want to this to be a conflict between the two of them. I think that's also a way in which 
um, we sometimes write uh, these stories where there has to be like some sort of a moment of tension about somebody's identity. And to me, mm-hmm. there wasn't, um, you know, we move on from that and really the problems that they face as a couple are really about the fact that they don't have any money, <laughs> you know, like a, a lot of, all the things that they both want to happen in their life or that are they're struggling with are because they don't have money or resources or access to all of these things that we see Stella and her family very like blithely enjoying. Um, so that was one of the things that I thought about writing that story. And as far as, as sort of color, I, th- I thought about that too, because so much of Jude's journey in this relationship is is really accepting that this man loves her. You know, she mm-hmm. finds it so hard. She's been raised under this really oppressive and violent ideology about color. Mm-hmm. Um, and she has never believed herself to be somebody who is beautiful or somebody that someone else might love. Uh, so she meets this person who really loves her and she's in, sort of incredulous about it. And she finds it really hard to believe. And I think that there can be something really frustrating from Reese's point of view of trying to love somebody who sort of resists you in that way. Um, You know, you're trying to offer somebody this gift and they don't want it. (laughs) And there could be um, something frustrating in that way of trying to be loving and kind to somebody who just doesn't believe that you could possibly mean to be loving and kind. So to me, there was sort of this dance between the two of them Um, and and that being a big part of their arc of both of them having to learn how to love and trust. And not only that, but loving, learning how to allow somebody to love you and learning how to trust somebody to love you. And I think both of them go through that journey. Um, For Jude, it really is is a huge um, challenge for her because she grew up with dark skin in this town mallard that taught her to hate herself. So how is she supposed to let Reese love her if she doesn't love herself? Um, so I thought about all of those things writing the, writing that relationship, but I really did enjoy it. I thought I think that those moments of tenderness were really important in a book where there is um, some brutality, um, and having those moments of sort of joy of all of these people hanging out in LA and uh, you know just having their parties and, and enjoying each other and building the sense of community and love and friendship that was really good for me. I think as I was writing the book, and I wanted to. Um, to- get in here to, 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 to also think about like Reese in many ways is also participating in something that um, Stella participates in, right? The idea of passing. So a Reese is passing in a sense that nobody actually gets to question his identity because in, in, the, in, in the binary world that we understand, he looks like this man, right? So to think about also the moment of like this vanishing, also the idea of as Reese is letting go of his past and becoming this man, the world is also seeing him as, as, as participating in his masculinity and his manhood. But there's some form of cis passing that also happens there. And how that changed the trajectory of his relationship with Jude, but also how he inhibited the, the places that he was at. Yeah, I mean, I think for Reese, I, I thought of his journey as very different than Stella's in a lot of ways. Um, I think he is somebody who reinvents himself in the way that Stella reinvents herself. Um, And these are both characters who kind of go west to do that in this very uh, sort of, you know, uh, kind of American Western mythology of going west to to reinvent yourself. Um, So I think that they had that in common. But for me, the really big difference is that, uh, you know, Reese changes physically, but who he is on the inside has remained, that he, he becomes truer to himself on the inside although on the outside he changes versus Stella who does not change on the outside at all, but mentally and emotionally and psychologically, she becomes a totally different person. Um, so to me, there was a way in which those stories were really in tension with each other. And I found that to be really interesting to think about the what change looks like and how we assume we know what change looks like. And you might see Reese and think he's a really different person but he's actually truer to himself now <laughs> that he looks different than he than mm-hmm. Stella, who has remained the same on the outside, but has become this person who would have been completely unrecognizable to her younger self. Mm. I think we are, you know, you've you've sort of alluded to this moment of brutality in the book, and I think that it, it I guess it ties into the next part of, of my question and. 
we we are having renewed discussions around trauma around generational trauma and what that might look like and so we see the manifestations of the trauma that stella and desiree experience as young children you know so desiree becomes very restless stella becomes very calm and stoic almost unmoving right but then you also see stella marry this man who in many ways could have looked like one of the men who inflicted the initial trauma and I'm really curious about how Stella, I mean, in your writing of that, of that relationship, what the navigation must have been like for Stella to be in this romantic relationship with somebody who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, may have quite easily been capable of inflicting that kind of trauma and that kind of violence, right? And whether that itself also adds to Stella's inability to confront her past, because here she is in a relationship with somebody who in many ways, you know, brings about some of that trauma that she's experienced, right? But also then leads to this avoidance of her past. And I'm curious about what the intersection between the past and the present for Stella looks like in that context of the romantic. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, that was something that I also found just interesting thinking about Stella is that she, you know, I think people re react to trauma very differently. Um, as you said, Desiree is someone who becomes very restless and she's got this kind of running in her blood that her daughter inherits and becomes a literal runner um, and, and also flees Mallard as soon as she gets the chance. Um, so she's got that kind of reaction and yet come, sort of, you know, in a way, in a kind of contradictory way, she is the one who returns to Mallard and remains there at this house mm -hmm. where she witnessed this hor horrific act of violence. She returns to the actual site of violence and lives out most of her adult life there. Um, and in the contrast, you have Stella, who um, is, you know, the one who you think does not want to leave, um, but she ends up sort of running directly into the arms of this community that harmed her and that originally inflicted the trauma on her. Mm. Um, and to me, there was something really interesting in that tension. And... Uh, the idea that Stella has to kind of live in that tension of she has been, you know, traumatized from this this act of violence she witnessed, and she looks at her husband and she thinks about the people um, who who committed the violence. Um, but I, I found that to be uh, just a complex way of thinking about trauma and how we react to trauma differently and what it says about us and who we are. Um, I I wanted to explore that in in Stella's marriage um, and. Mm -hmm in her sort of, I don't know, in her, uh, her very uneasy role um, as she's slowly becoming this thing. Uh, she's becoming uh, sort of more, and she's getting more and more invested in, in the project of whiteness, um, even though she has been victimized by it. Mm. Um, and I think that there's ways in which a lot of us are that way in our lives. Um, we sometimes draw near to what hurts us and, and why do we do that? Um, to me, that was just an interesting question that I wanted to explore. I wanted to also think about, I mean, I suppose the, the, the thinking about the mothers and thinking about the mothers and their relationship with their daughters in this book was quite interesting mm. because you have the relationship between Desiree and Jude which in many parts is tumultuous, but at least they have like a real authentic mm. relationship and uh, they're able to connect and meet themselves at different stages in their lives. But to contrast that with Stella's relationship with Ken and how it just seems like they can never meet each other. And mm. it, it, it in many ways speaks to the fact that Stella feels like an imposter in her own life. So does she, the decisions that she makes about letting her daughter in, what do they look like? And we see this later on in the book where like, she really wants to get to know her mother, right? And she really wants to get to know where do you come from? What do you do? And this woman is just not letting in. And I wanted to ask about why the contrast of those two relationships, because, um, you know, we, yeah, what, what was the contrast of those two relationships and why was it important for you to, to, to think about daughters having somewhat difficult relationship with their mothers? Um, yeah. And just to add on, sorry, but, but just to add on to the clock on question, which is something that he and I spoke about a little bit earlier, <laughs> is also the ways in which uh, there's, there's a rejection of identities that we see. And it's quite clear, like you're saying in Stella, you know, so Stella rejects the identity of blackness and moves on. 
But there's a scene where Judah's born, right? And uh, Judah's dark-skinned. Her mother's obviously not. But her mother experiences a deep relief at this child not looking anything like her. In the same way that Stella also experiences a relief at this child being able to pass even more than she's able to. And I found that also to be an interesting contrast how the rejection of identities for both mothers seems to come into play in how their children look phenotypically, yeah. but also in their relationships. So just to add on to the clock and questions about yeah. relationships between daughters and their mothers. Yeah, well, you guys are super close readers. <laughs> um, these are these are questions I have not yet been asked. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so so yeah. So I guess about those pairs of relationships. I think with with um, Desiree and Jude, you know, that's the first relationship you're introduced to in the book. Those are the first two people that you meet. Um, and with that relationship, I I was wanted to explore. Um, you know, you know that Jude, as soon as you meet Jude on those first pages, you know that she's going to have a hard time growing up in this place. Um, and the way then in which she comes to sort of distrust and resent her mother in a sense for bringing her to this place. Um, although they do reach a place, I think, in their relationship and like they have an adult relationship with each other because they can be at least honest with each other. Um, definitely more than Stella can with Kennedy. <laughs> um, and I think for, for Stella and Kennedy, I was not that interested in their relationship at first, but I think when I started to think about what that relationship would feel like, really from both of them, for me, thinking about Stella feeling like, as you said, that she's an imposter, that her daughter is just another thing that she's kind of stolen, <laughs> or, or her daughter is someone that, you know, she's, that really belongs to somebody else, but she's kind of taken her. Um, I kept thinking about what that would be like to feel that way about your own child and, and how you could have that type of relationship or what type of relationship you could have with a child who doesn't feel like they're yours. Um, mm. So that, that was interesting to me. And then from Kennedy's point of view of wanting to be close to her mother and her mother, again, as I was saying kind of with Jude and Reese, but wanting to be close to someone who pushes you away and keeps you out and you don't understand why. And thinking about the knowledge gap uh, between even Kennedy and Jude, because Jude knows sort of the family lore. She knows about Stella. She knows about what happened to their father. She has all this information. Kennedy has none of that information, but she has just sort of inherited the situation. She's kind of stumbled into it and inherited this mother who behaves in ways that she doesn't understand. And she comes from this family and from this place that she's never heard of. Uh, you know, what that would feel like for Kennedy and trying to cultivate this relationship with her mother. And she thinks that her mother just kind of, you know, she thinks that her mother doesn't even really like her. and and. And the act, the fact that that Stella is in in part very standoffish because she's trying to protect this life that she has built um, and protect the relationship that she has with her daughter within this life that she's built. But because she is doing that, she's actually pushing her daughter away. And there was something in that irony of both of them. <laughs> they're both kind of in this impossible situation with each other, and they both don't quite see it or understand why. Um, so there was something really fraught about that. And I think in general, I just, I'm really interested in mother daughter relationships and how complex they are and how they shape who we become either in what we inherit or what we sort of, how we create ourselves in opposition to somebody else. Um, so I'm always interested in that thematically. And this book gave me two really interesting pairs of mothers and daughters to explore. Speaking about um, locations, Manlard is such an interesting location for me for a number of reasons, right? Manlard is this third place, which when people read the book, you don't want to give away too much, but when people read the book, they will see why. Manlard is this third place, but I think that Manlard is a location, a physical location, but it's also metaphorical, right, for this desire to transcend blackness, right, and how even though, for example, there are people in the town who can transcend, who can pass, they're still not protected by this ability to look closer to whites than to blacks. So they're still not protected from the violence that white supremacy can enact on them, right? But it also then leads to Jude having a very complicated relationship with hometowns. And I mean, she makes a comment about how, I think it's Reese who makes a comment about how black people don't have the luxury of disliking or hating their hometowns in the ways that white people are able to extricate themselves from their hometowns. And I was very curious about why Reese would make a statement like that about hometowns when you think of the kind of violence that Mallard has inflicted on Jude and the kind of violence that 
places like our hometowns can inflict on dark-skinned women, you know, what it means to be a black woman in certain spaces is the site of violence. And Mallet for me represented that. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of, of who can sort of disregard home, um, I think it's a complicated thing and, and, and uh, who feels free to do that um, and who feels free uh, who feels free to, yeah, to sort of disown their home and, and create themselves in a new way. I think for me, and part of that, that was kind of inspired just sort of conversely by the love most of the black people I know have for hometowns, even the people who have left or have a complicated relationship will still defend their city. Um, <laughs> there are people I know who love their city. I mean, the people I know who are from like Chicago, I mean, you cannot say one bad thing about Chicago. They will, um, you know, truly go off on you. They love Chicago. I'm living in New York now. I mean, New Yorkers are, you know, uh, black New Yorkers love New York. Um, so there are a lot, often a lot of problems in these places and a lot of uh, things that people experience in these places. But this feeling of discarding home is kind of a way of discarding family in a sense. And that for a lot of people, I mean, I think particularly for a lot of black people is something that's kind of unthinkable. Like you don't just cast aside your family. Um, mm. And I think that that's part of why what Stella does is really uh, so transgressive um, in a lot of ways. Um, as you were saying in Mallard, it's, it's a town of light-skinned people, but they aren't living as white. It's a black town. Um, they, they don't gain any tangible benefits for being light-skinned except lightness. You know, they're not wealthy people. They're not, uh, they don't have great jobs. They live in this farm town. They still experience racist violence. So for me, there was something about the futility of what they're doing, which is pursuing lightness for its own sake, um, with no real tangible benefits like the ones mm. Stella gets by deciding to actually be white. Uh, but at the same time, these are people who look down on somebody like Stella for leaving behind her family and community, because mm. that to them is, is like the unthinkable thing. Um, so there was something so tense about that relationship between people in home and family and community, even though, as you said, family and community and home can be oppressive. But this idea that the right thing to do is to sort of stay and endure it <laughs> uh, versus leaving to fashion yourself a new life. Um, I think that's part of why I found what Stella so interesting, because on one one way of looking at her is that, that she is this liberatory figure that to go out mm. in the world and fashion yourself and make yourself the person you want to be is actually liberating yeah. and, and positive in a way. Um, if, if, you know, if you sort of divorce it from its racial implications, which obviously you can't, um, but if you just look at it as her going out into the world and deciding to be somebody new, there's a way in which that can feel very liberating. Uh, but we see the, the, the effect of it on her family and the people that she's left mm. behind. Mm. Yep. Um, well, bring back Jen into the conversation. She says there's some people who have a couple of questions and then hopefully we'll get some time for her to just read the first page of The Vanishing Heart because I think people really like want to, you know, get into the book if they haven't made the decision. So sometimes authors reading really gives people that push. So Jen, we'll welcome you back and then we'll hear some couple of questions. Hi, thank you very much. Um, well, as a reader, this is exactly the kind of book conversation I want to see. And now that we are all in lockdown, it's really cool that we're given the opportunity to connect with authors from all around the world and have these kinds of conversations. And this is why we were so pleased to have the opportunity to host this event and why we're big fans of the Cheeky Natives. Thanks, guys. I mean, this is, you've asked some fascinating questions and it surprised the author, which is always, <laughs> always <laughs> a good thing. We have a few questions. Um, I'm going to bring them up on the screen. I'll read them out for people who might just be listening and not watching. The first one is from Asanda, who says, thank you so much for this conversation. I have a question about writing influences. You have been compared to James Baldwin and Toni Morrison. How does that feel? And are there any other authors you feel influenced your writing? Um, I mean, it feels great. <laughs> um, it feels great, but um, you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a great honor to be uh, mentioned at all in the same sentences as, as two of our finest uh, writers to ever live. Um, and those are two writers that, that I admire. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, there will only be one James Baldwin, there will only be one Toni Morrison. Um, I think as far as um, who've, who've influenced me, those two are certainly huge influences. Um, I love Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I love uh, uh, 
Jasmine Ward, Dorothy Allison. Um, I love Alice Walker. Um, I love a lot of different writers um, who uh, really gave me a lot of language of thinking about my own experiences and 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 sort of took me um, into this world of storytelling uh, that that I have found myself at home in. So thank you. I I, I appreciate that. It's an honor to to be mentioned with those writers. Cool. We've got another sort of similar question that I think I'll ask now. Um, <laughs> Marie, such a boring question, but I always want to know what others are reading. So are there any other any books that Britt has recently read that she's enjoyed and would recommend? So I think you've mentioned a few, but maybe if there's any sort of new authors that you've discovered over the past sort of lockdown period, maybe, or <laughs> the past year. Yeah, I've read um, Luster by Raven Leilani, um, which just came out in the U.S., and it's great. Um, it's a really... Uh, beautifully written, but also darkly very funny book. Um, so that's a great book. Um, I recently also read this book called Feast Your Eyes by Myla Goldberg, uh, which is written in the, the form of an art catalog describing photographs that you never see. Um, so it's really brilliant and, and beautiful. I cried very um, intensely when I finished reading it, so it's very moving. Um, those are two that I read recently that I really love. Cool. Let's, uh, I'll make a note of those, um, you know, and I'll post them on the reading list so people can also, like, get some good recommendations. Um, Stephen has more of a comment than a question, as someone always has in a book, in a book <laughs> event. Um, great point and great conversation. Emily Baraka once stated that in America, black is a country. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. But thank you for sharing <laughs> that quote. I love it. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Asanda, who says, I have friends who are twins, and it's such a fascinating relationship. How did you get inside a relationship like that? What research did you do into twinship, if I can call it that? Yeah, you know, I didn't do a whole lot of research into it. I thought I was going to read a lot of books, just sort of deep diving into twin psychology. Uh, but really, I ultimately just drew on my relationship with my sisters. We're not twins, but I have one sister who's two years older than me and one who's 10 years older than me. Um, and we have a close relationship with both of them, although it's different with each of them. Um, but I was, was really interested in that, the way in which that relationship, I think with sisters um, can be uh, really um, intimate and also claustrophobic. And to me, it was sort of that nature of twinship that I found really, really interesting is this idea of these, these girls who are so incredibly close and can rely and trust on each other in that way but also feeling trapped by that closeness and both wanting to break out in some way and being a little afraid to do it until Stella is finally the one who surprises you by just doing it. Um, so to me, it was that dynamic of, of just sisterhood that I was able to draw on to try to represent the nature of twins, which I imagine is what I have experienced with my sisters, but ramped up times a hundred <laughs> of, of, of that, that intimacy and that claustrophobia. Are you close in age with your sisters? Um, I have one who's two years older than me and one who's 10 years older. So we have my sister's 10 years older. She sometimes acts like a second mother to me. Like that's a very different dynamic. But my I sister know, is I two years older. My, Wait, my little sister 10 years younger than me. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's a very specific dynamic. And then my sister who's two years older than me. We shared a bunch of the same friends when we were at school, you know? So I had those different kind of relationships, but I'm close to both of them in, in very different ways. Um, but but to me, that was what I was able to draw on to think about those those twins. We have a another sort of, I don't want to say inevitable question, but another question that I'm sure we all want to answer to. What is your next adventure in storytelling from Carl? <laughs> I like the way that was phrased. Um, was, that was phrased more colorfully than what are you working on next? So I like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm working on another novel. It's still extremely early, um, so I can't say too much, but it's about music and it's about uh, a rivalry. Um, so it's a different relationship between women, <laughs> one that's quite antagonistic, um, but it's been really fun to, to venture into this very different world than The Vanishing Half. It sounds fascinating. I'm sure we can't wait for that. Um, <laughs> you're also, I'm involved, well, I mean, um, you are the, the the, the book has been optioned for TV. It was an intense, um, you know, what's the word? Auction for the rights. Mm -hmm. And I, I've read that you're not involved in writing that, but, I'm, but I think you probably are, you know, involved in choosing who's going to do it or, you know, you're producing in some way. How's that going? Yeah, I, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm an executive producer. Um, I'm not writing, uh, but um, we brought on some great writers to, to tackle it. Um, and we have a great creative team. So I'm really excited to weigh in and consult and read the drafts and give them notes. But I'm really happy to hand off uh, this task to somebody who knows how to write for TV um, and be able to return to the world of books, which is where I feel most at home. So that's another adventure in storytelling, just a slightly different type of. Yes. Yes. And so, and somebody else's adventure more than my own, thankfully. <laughs> so Stephen has just said he's just bought a copy on Amazon, which is my <laughs> cute. Story. If you haven't bought a copy yet, buy a copy <laughs> now. You can, you can get it at all your uh, local bookstores, independent and non-independent. You can get it online on all, um, all the retailers. You can get it in ebook and hard copy, um, you know, version so um you know we really recommend that you go out and buy a book and uh we would stress that that's almost compulsory after watching this uh, video so. <laughs> yeah and i think also to get it in audio book because i uh had it in audio and um i mean i always love to read because the imagining is so amazing but to the person who reads the audio book is really incredible um, so to get it in audio book as well as you and audio books, and it's always nice to have a good reader. It really makes or breaks the book sometimes. Cool. That's all the questions we have. Carl just says thanks. So <laughs> I think we'll all say thanks. I don't know if you guys have uh, Alma and Lechovolnaro. Do you have any closing remarks or other something else to add? Yes. Uh, just to ask uh, Britt to oh, read sorry. the first page of the Vanishing Half. Just, yes, and then uh, we'll give her her flowers before we go, and then, yeah. Sure. Sure. I think I'll remove, I'll remove it from the chat um, for the reading so that we can have the full screen. Okay. And um, if you, when you're done, like maybe go to this or say, you know, thanks or something, and then I'll bring us back. Got it. The morning when Lulabon ran to the diner to break the news, and even now, many years later, everyone remembers the shock of Sweaty Lou pushing through the glass doors, chest heaving, neckline darkened with his own effort. The barely awake customers clamored around him, ten or so, although more would lie and say that they'd been there too, if only to pretend that this once they'd witnessed something truly exciting. In that little farm town, nothing surprising ever happened, not since the Vignes twins had disappeared. But that morning in April 1968, on his way to work, Lou spotted Desiree Vignes walking along Partridge Road, carrying a small leather suitcase. She looked exactly the same as when she'd left at 16, still light, her skin the color of sand, barely wet, her hipless body reminding him of a branch caught in a strong breeze. She was hurrying, her head bent, and Lou paused here, a bit of a showman. She was holding the hand of a girl, seven or eight, and black as tar. Blue-black, he said, like she flown direct from Africa. Loose egg house splintered into a dozen different conversations. The line cook wondered if it had been Desiree after all, since Lou was turning 60 in May and still too vain to wear his eyeglasses. The waitress said that it had to be. Even a blind man could spot a Vignes girl, and it certainly couldn't have been that other one. The diner is abandoning grits and eggs on the counter, didn't care about that Vignes foolishness, who on earth was the dark child? Could she possibly be Desiree's? Well, who else could it be, Lou said. He grabbed a handful of napkins from the dispenser, dabbing his damp forehead. Maybe it's an orphan that got took in. I just don't see how nothing that black could have come out Desiree. Desiree seemed like the type to take in no orphan to you. Of course she didn't. She was a selfish girl. They remembered anything about Desiree. It was that, and most didn't recall much more. The twins had been gone 14 years, nearly as long as anyone had ever known them vanished from bed after the Founders' Day dance while their mothers slept right down the hall. One morning, the twins crowded in front of their bathroom mirror, four identical girls fussing with their hair. The next, the bed was empty, the covers pulled back like any other day, taut when Stella made it, crumpled when Desiree did. The town spent all morning searching for them, calling their names through the woods, wondering stupidly if they had been taken. Their disappearance seemed as sudden as the rapture, all of Mallard, the sinners left behind. I think I will stop, stop there. Thank you very much. Sure, this was amazing. I, I think in closing, just to say, Britt, um, 
Alma and I were having this conversation earlier, and I think you may have seen my tweet when I was like, wait, is this Toni Morrison? Because I think <laughs> really, <laughs> I think really, more than anything, the writing in this book is exquisite. Mm. The storytelling is amazing. But I find myself returning to certain passages in the book because I'm like, oh my gosh, like the imagery is so palatable that I, I want to relive it again. And I just wanted to say thank you for writing The Vanishing Half. I think it's mm. it's really going to stand the test of time. And like mm. I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's not only a piece of literature, it's really going to go into the canon of critical race theory because in many ways it sits alongside conversations that Americans are having about race. So thank you thank so you. much for thank you. allowing us to, you know, a peek into your mind. Thank you. Um, I mean, just to, you know, echo what Atafunol has said, this, I read The Mothers and it's so funny because I pulled up a tweet the other day and I, I posted about, oh my God, I love The Mothers. Um, and I was post, I was on call, but I wasn't sad because I was reading The Mothers. And um, and then it was the vanishing half, you know, and, and to have seen, to be able to see ourselves in writing is something so profound about black women, black people writing about themselves. It's such a profound act of resistance, writing against the silence and uh we just want to honor you at the cheeky natives and once again congratulate you on writing a brilliant book that not only will stand the test of time but in many ways it's a timely book but it's also a timeless book and so we just wanted to give you your flowers at the cheeky natives and um congratulate you once again we can't wait to see what follows from here thank only you goodness. i really appreciate it thank you so much for having me Thank you so much, and we'd like to thank Jonathan Ball for sort of pulling this together. Jonathan Ball Publishers, um, who distribute the book in South Africa. Thank you to Le Tomono and Alma, and thank you so much to Britt Bennett, our featured author this evening, um, and thanks for a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.